Fleet Airship Wing 1, so hastily eliminated after World War II, was recommissioned in January of 1949 under longtime airship veteran Captain Alfred Cope. The command would control the operational squadrons. From the Naval Air Facility Weeksville, North Carolina, the wing oversaw the gradual rebuilding of the U.S. Navy airship fleet. A new squadron, Airship Development Squadron ZX-11, was formed at the Naval Air Station Key West, Florida. The world was stunned in June 1950 when 135,000 communist troops invaded their southern neighbor, South Korea. On June 27, 1950, President Harry S. Truman deployed the 7th Fleet to waters off Taiwan. The U.S. Navy readied for war once again. Another airship squadron, ZP-3, was commissioned that September. President Harry Truman paid a visit to the Key West blimps. The Florida airships enjoyed quick access to deep water and nearby submarine facilities for realistic training exercises, but ASW warfare was changing. Passive sensors were unable to detect new submarines that could hide under thermal currents. Toad sonar was needed to find improved submarines that could dive deeper and stay under longer. To utilize towed sonar proven on the M ships, the K ships would undergo one final upgrade series, creating the ZP-3K airships. The ZP-3K rebuild extensively updated the aging 2K airship. A sophisticated new magnetic anomaly detector, the ASQ-8, was installed. The sonarman was moved above the pilots. The mechanical panel was incorporated into the flight deck and a powerful hydraulic winch was installed aft to deploy the towed sonar fish. Now submarines could no longer hide beneath changing temperature layers below the surface. The United Nations cause in Korea suffered heavily when the Chinese Communists joined the North Koreans. Lakers began the upgrade program then Goodyear Aircraft set up a production line to create ZP-3K airships fashioned from war surplus and even former advertising ships. Another squadron, ZP-4, was commissioned in May 1951 at NAF Weeksville. Crews transitioned to the ZP-3K. Training with U.S. submarines, the airships would drop small concrete practice bombs so their adversaries could safely determine the blimp crew's accuracy. In one exercise, the airship's bomb scored a direct hit on the submarine's periscope, destroying it. ZP-4 deployed most of its ships to Kinley Air Force Base, Bermuda, for a six-week NATO Atlantic anti-submarine exercise. Mooring masts were shipped by LST and squadron personnel assembled them on the island. At sea refueling, developed on carriers, was made even more flexible when the airships took on fuel without landing. With the hose method, a hovering airship used its winch to pull up a fuel hose. It was a challenge for the pilot to keep the increasingly heavy airship aloft and on station. However, the refueling technique was so effective, the crew's endurance became the limiting factor in the mission. In July 1953, an armistice brought an uneasy halt to the Korean fighting. Soviet bloc nations continued to threaten the sea lanes with more capable submarines. But lack of employment in Korea hurt the LTA wing with the Navy. Time K ship was now reaching the limit of modernization as P4 ship was given an experimental navy blue paint job. With their towed sonar and twin mad sensors, the ZP3K airships were turned over to the reserves with their final missions carrying huge recruiting banners. 
Admiral Rosendahl himself was present for the final flight of ZP-3K airship, the 43, in March of 1959 with aviation pilot Dick Nye at the controls. Operation Plumb Bob and other nuclear tests oversaw their inglorious end, although two of the four condemned airships were destroyed near Yucca Flats, Nevada, without the use of bombs. A nuclear bomb trigger test hit one of the airships with enough force to break it off its nose fitting. Although recaptured and repairable, it was ripped anyway. A second K-ship was tethered at 500 feet, its lettering painted over so the intense flash would not burn through the envelope before the shock wave hit. The aging bag failed as helium was squeezed more than air tearing at the forward suspension point, a quick death for an old warhorse. The airship made the most stable and long-legged research platform, helping develop and perfect systems that were too bulky or aerodynamically unsuitable for airplanes. The large M ships carried a variety of experimental gear, their long articulated cars providing a spacious working environment and the helium's lift a greatly persistent alternative to gravity. The U-boat snorkel allowed the submarine to run its diesel submerged. New technology named Sniffer used the airship's ability to fly downwind to sample the air for the telltale exhaust of a submarine. It was not reliable near the coast owing to automotive pollution. Another program had explored the idea of mounting a pontoon on an airship. Initial tests with the old L1 on Lake Milton showed the single float mounting was not adequate. An improved two-float design was built and tested on Lake Erie. The stable landing gear allowed the L1 to alight and maintain station while conserving fuel. Water ballast was taken aboard by means of a small pump. The bow was kept into the wind by means of a sea anchor. Yet these promising results never found their way to becoming operational hardware. An entirely new airship was needed, but no one wanted to abandon the infrastructure built for the more than 130 K-ships. To enhance the all-new ZSG-4 airship, a newly developed lightweight envelope material, Forestan, was used. The car was skinned with magnesium instead of aluminum, and additional utility racks were mounted on the pylons. Inside was a modernized avionics suite with one crewman dedicated to the sonar station above the pilots. The ZSG-4 had rudder and elevator yokes that could be duplicates or set as separate controls. Techniques had been developed that allowed gasoline to be taken aboard from fleet oilers. First tested with L1 before the war, the airship could now be refueled like any other unit of the fleet without the need of an aircraft carrier. The ZSG-4 would lower a weighted cable, the oiler would attack the refueling hose, the airship's winch would pull it into position, and the fuel would be pumped aboard. Then the bag method allowed an oiler to quickly refuel an airship, lowering its weighted winch line, the blimp picked up and hauled away a bag of fuel. The crew could then pump the gas into the tanks, giving the bag back and return to station in a short time. The powerful winches were also used with water bags, so at last the weight of the burned off fuel could be easily replaced. ZSG-4 was equipped with strengthened landing gear for carrier operations. The SG-4 had a new beta constant speed propeller and combined throttle control that allowed smoother transitions. 
Towing the sonar fish at low altitude required skill to keep track of an evading submarine. In one exercise, a ZSG-4 hit the water, but the remaining crew, led by command pilot Don Layton, managed to float free, restart one engine, and make it back to Weeksville. The ZSG-4 gave good service until it was found the new Fortizan fabric envelopes couldn't resist environmental effects. All those type bags in the fleet had to be condemned. Operating with the reserves, the last ZSG-4 airship flight was made in October 1959. To replace it, the promising new ZS-2G-1 airship was designed and built by Goodyear Aircraft. 150,000 cubic feet larger in displacement, it featured a power-assisted control system for its unique Y-shaped three-part tail surfaces. More powerful 800 horsepower engines were mounted on single outriggers. The elongated car carried twice the armament of its predecessors, from small depth bombs to the advanced homing torpedo. In exercises chasing U.S. submarines, crews operated from carriers and tracked submarines using Jezebel sonoboys and receivers to identify individual submarines by known propeller signatures. The submarines could not detect these passive sensors which also gave their bearing on the console indicator. Julie Gear was employed to plot a submarine's course, making a surprise attack possible. The ZS-2G-1 mounted a large, powerful winch aft surrounded by wide-angle doors and windows. The advanced towed sonar fish featured the newest technology to keep the towed sonar very quiet in the water. But the deep diving sonar was active, so the submarine crew could hear it pinging. The towed fish fed a display on the sonarman's console. The ASW officer coordinated the avionics suite's operation with the men at the control yokes of the airship. No longer could a fast submarine outrun a pattern of fixed sonoboys. The ZS-2G-1 was faster and more maneuverable than its submerged opponent, more than a match for any submarine then in the ocean. Like its predecessor, the new blimp was equipped with a high-pressure tire and landing gear built for punishing carrier landings. Once secured on the flight deck, the ZS-2G-1 crews trained to reman and replenish with minimal time on deck. Fuel and water had already been brought aboard airships via their onboard winches. Next, in-air rearming was perfected as contact type depth charges and homing torpedoes would be retrieved with the powerful winch. With refueling and replenishment being accomplished without landing, the long-endurance ZS-2G-1 could outlast its crew. A method of changing out the airmen was developed that would not require an aircraft carrier deck landing. First tested on the ZSG-4, Project Wygar mounted a man-rated basket on the airship's powerful winch. The seemingly risky procedure first had to be proven by Goodyear employees from a ship using a ZSG-4. The wiring for the sonar fish was adapted for an intercom from the basket to the airship. Donning the protective gear the fresh air crew could be hoisted aboard and two or three weary crewmen could be lowered back down to the surface vessel. The Navy then perfected the process at sea with the ZS-2G-1. Fresh crew could change out with weary crew 
from most any unit of the fleet, the process not requiring aircraft carriers flat top. In spite of its dangerous appearance, there were no fatal accidents in the Weigar program, but a larger airship crew, large enough to provide its own relief, was an idea whose time was coming. The ZTG, or Training Command for Lighter Than Air, was established at Glencoe, Georgia. Airship strength had reached its post-war peak of 44 craft between 1956 and 1957. The tri-tailed ZS-2G1 also operated from Weeksville, North Carolina and Glencoe. The airship had been built with a power assisted control system that developed operational problems. In Sandy Landing at Lakehurst, the gear collapsed and the props dug in, killing the engines. The powerless blimp drifted away from Lakehurst out of control, eventually coming to rest on farm property. Another ZS-2G1 had a similar bad landing at Glencoe, Georgia but the crew abandoned ship. <clears throat> Yet another burned to its stays in a matter of minutes. The ZS-2G1's problematic behavior and high noise level made it unpopular with crews and there was little effort to isolate and repair problems in the design. After a very short career, the type was retired from anti-submarine duty in the summer of 1957. A single ZS-2G1, the 240, would remain at Lakehurst in a research role. Meanwhile, for submarines, it was a case of if you can't beat them, join them. Using aerodynamic studies of the British airship R-101 and the flying aircraft carrier USS Akron, a completely new submarine hull took shape. The USS Albacore was not only shaped like an airship, submarine men were stationed at Lakers to fly blimps to gain insight on how the new submarine should be handled underwater. Eventually, the two-yoke control design of the blimp was borrowed and adapted to fly the new submarine underwater at unprecedented 20-knot speeds. Naval warfare had been revolutionized by harnessing the atom. Nuclear power provided the means for these undersea boat to become a true submarine, and its fantastic strength would drive the boats to unbelievable speeds. The U.S. Navy airship had to take a huge evolutionary step. <laughs>